started um, probably before six o'clock because it's pretty quick. I'm getting the system down pretty quick about being able to process them. I do that anyway. I take the um, full stream um, because we stream from the call to worship, the Lord's Supper, invitation song, and everything. Well, pretty much everything. And then afterwards, we just record when we start just the lesson. So I upload that, and then eventually, like within four days, I take the full live stream out because, you know, we don't want... I figure the live stream is for worship. So, so you might see occasionally the double lessons. I've been categorizing them, too, based on a sermon or if it's like in the Hebrews or the Roman book. So if you want to go back, you can look at those as well. All right, well, let's get started um, into this. This is the second most exciting book to me uh, when it comes to helping to, I guess, uh, confirm and make myself feel better about my worthlessness before God and before others and feeling so unworthy. Uh, my misunderstanding when I would look back and think about those who weren't Jews. What would happen to them? It was always a, a struggle because the Bible tells us about these people going from Adam and Eve all the way through Abraham. And, and you hear these wonderful, crazy stories, but they were all descendants of Abraham. And I always wondered about, what about everybody who's not? So are they in trouble? What's going on? And that is a misconception on our part because, one, we have to go back and focus on why did God write the book? I mean, he could have wrote about a lot of good people. We know Job. <laughs> you know, Job was just one of many that were righteous people he could have wrote about. But he wasn't trying to tell us about every good person who lived, every person that God found right before him. We know there were others. But he needed to tell the story about how he was going to fulfill a promise. And so he could not sit and write volumes of everybody else. He kept it focused and focusing down through Abraham, through Isaac, all the way through down to where Jesus comes. And so it had to be very focused. So even the Jews, though, started to develop this kind of attitude, I think, in that they believed that they had the one true God. And they got made fun of. And they were, there was anti-Semitism from the time they organized I mean, even in Egypt, if you think about it, you could say that was anti-Semitism, right? Because, I mean, they were persecuted, all sorts of things. They were weird. They worshiped one God. And so that set them apart. And they knew they had the right God because they saw his powers. Rightly so. They should have been. They rightly so knew that God had blessed them and that they were getting many wonderful things. But it tainted them. And... It changed who they were. I see that as a Christian sometimes a very deep concern I have is that how do we look at others that are outside what we would say outside of Christ, outside of God, God's blessings and such. The book of Romans, I think, has been misunderstood as well. I think, one, the fact that this is one of, the, it is the longest letter in ancient literature. There is no other letter that they've dug up or found that is this long. Many of those letters were short based on the scroll. They were limited and they would keep it to that. The average length of Paul's letters was 1,700 words. This one is over 7,000. This one is very different and I think that when we go back and understand the historical reference of Rome, Rome being built by Jewish Christians, then expanded to bringing in Gentile Christians, then Claudius throwing them out, and then it become just a Gentile church in Rome, and then Nero allowed them to come back. Well, guess who's been running the church for all those years? The Gentiles. No Jews. They didn't just throw out the Jewish Christians out of town. They threw all the Jews out. So when they came back under Nero, you have another change in dynamics. Historically, we can point to, that Paul needed to go to Jerusalem, but was in Corinth. He wants to go, but he can't. They got a big problem over there. So that unique problem has brought about one of the most magnificent books of explaining God's 
overall plan of salvation and, and an aspect of his mind that we can't really capture anywhere else. <clears throat> now, the fundamental point of it, he starts out right off, is the idea that it's about the gospel. It's about the gospel. So now, if you're somebody who's struggling within this church, and this is a part of that context that we always got to remind yourselves when we start to talk Romans, I want you to think about the problem that was going on in the church at Rome and the issues that Paul is trying to address. You have Gentiles that were Roman. Romans were polytheist. In other words, multiple gods, highly superstitious. If something bad was happening to you, you have messed up and made a god mad. And so that's why we had a famine. That's why we had an earthquake. That's why we had a tsunami. And so it was a matter of national threat that if people didn't worship all the gods and made one of them mad, then that's how they would find it. Now, that's still in them. You know, Gene and I were talking about this. You know, people don't come to Christ and just automatically come up out of baptism and voila, you know, their, everything of their past is gone. And now they bring nothing. No, the Gentiles brought who they were about. The Jews brought who, what they were about into that church. And then it dynamically flip flipped. It went from Gent, Jew to Gentile expansion to just Gentile back to now Jews coming back and we have this conflict. The Jews come back and they're not being received the way they want it. The Gentile Christians in that church going, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, wait a minute. There's a reason you guys were thrown out of Rome. By the way, wasn't it your people that rejected the Messiah and crucified him, you Jewish Christians? So don't sit there and look at me. You know, you guys are something. So there's a lot of things going on that I think we see him dealing with in this letter. But they all became in that relationship because of the gospel. And so I think that's why one of the very first verses, I loaded the wrong sermon. I wrote a Hebrews. How did that get up there? I'm sitting there looking at the scripture there, and I'm like, wait a minute. That's not even the right one. Oh, man, I'm glad we're not live streaming. This would be even worse. But I had to restart the whole computer. And it takes forever to load. I guess we shouldn't have been talking, huh, Jack? <laughs> I was, we were talking about something. Okay, here we go. These are the right slides. So as we have to kind of review and bring us back together, after all I've just said, looking at what he's talking about is, one, the gospel really is what they started out with in this relationship. And it's only through the gospel that you're saved. That's going to be important to the Jew when he starts to deal with their ideas about Mosaic law and works and such like that. The other thing he brings up is, He's equalizing that all people, regardless of who you are, you're sinners. And, but I think even more so, he brings up this very important point that applies to us today, is that everybody can know there's a God. You notice even when we read it, he keeps saying they are without excuse, that they knew, that they suppressed it, that they had knowledge. They had an option. And so last Sunday afternoon, I was talking about how that, that question gets posed sometimes where people will ask me, they'll say, well, what about that poor person that's born in a Pacific island and never heard anything about the gospel and wasn't baptized? You're saying they're going to go to hell. And I keep saying, you know, why are you putting this on God? You're making it sound like there's a problem, that God somehow, you know, that it's his fault. I don't know, 
But I do understand from this passage that we look at in, in the first chapter that he talks about that everybody knows there's a God, that it's in us. We know this and we will seek it out. This is what's going to be very, I think, just so amazing because of that problem I told you about when you think about whether was it just the Jews that were saved before Christ came? Were they the only ones? Because that's what the book looks like. And that kind of fits with this idea of the guy sitting out in the Pacific Island somewhere. That if he never hears it, then, oh man, poor guy. He's not going to be saved. So I want you to notice it that he talks about it here in the very first chapter is the fact that people do know and had a choice. Now, the ones he's talking about here are ones who have now suppressed the truth or rejected it flat out. And there's consequences to that. That's something that he brings out. And Suzanne and I were talking about it on the way in, and, and I, I, I think that I haven't been able to express it as well, and I think I do now. You see, because you know what God wants, you have a choice, God has said. Now, these, the people in this condition, have chose not to obey. Imagine a house, a father, he has seven to ten children in this house, and it's out in the middle of nowhere, it's very remote. It has all the food that it, they would want, has everything. But there were rules in order to make the house functional. You got that many kids in one, one dwelling place. And then finally, for the parent to say, you know what? Because you're not listening to me, you don't honor me. Here's the keys to the house. I'm out. I'm going to give you up. I'm going to let you have your own way. And the consequences of that is exactly what Paul describes. It's not that God made them evil, that God somehow put this wickedness in them to come out. What happened is, is in the absence of God, that's what comes about. You leave a house full of children by themselves, the keys to the car, access to the chainsaw, <laughs> the shotguns, gas cans, anything they want, what do you think is going to happen? And the consequence as well, that's going to be a very miserable place to live for all those kids. They're going to fight. They're going to dominate each other. And that's what, in a worldly way, that God says he did. He backed away because they refused. And he said, okay, have it your own way. Go ahead. And that's why when he says, and they professed to be wise, but yet they were foolish. And that's what happened. So they started doing things like, you know, murder, strife, hate, all these things that he's talking about. And then sexual debasement, things that they would do to their own bodies, they would do to one another. And then he concludes that by saying, and not only were they doing it, but they were approving of it. When they saw it done to others, they were okay with it. That's okay. Wait a minute. He just killed that guy. He just robbed that guy. He just raped that person. He just, eh. That, you know, and that's what happens when God's not there. And I think that's a sign that we can see alive and well. It's not complicated to know God. He says in the first chapter as well. Just go outside and look. Just look at a newborn baby. Just look around. For somebody to say that there is no God, and let's just say there is no designer, that there's no intelligence behind all of it, is a fool. Is truly a fool. And the consequences, what we see, I think, is the agnostics, the atheists, and all of them. So there's no excuse at all. That's where he wraps up really to this point where we come into the chapter 2. And saying, well, let me, I'm going to skip through this since we're already. There we go. So now it's an interesting transition because I used to think that he was turning immediately now, describing the condition of all of mankind, they're condemned, and now he's going and turning on the Jew or, or on the Gentile or one or the other. I think this section we're going to look at tonight, he's really talking about people who feel very self-righteous. So let's go ahead and read 1 through 5, chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, 
Every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourselves because you, the judge, practice the very things, same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the, the riches in his kindness and the forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your heart, your heart and impentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So now he's really coming back to the person who believes that they're very moral, that they're looking at themselves. Does this strike you as familiar? You who judge, yet you're doing the very same thing? You know, Jesus taught exactly the same concept in Matthew 7. In verse 1, he says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first pull out the log of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your own brother's eye. So it's the same principle, isn't it? We look at others, they don't match our values, and we basically are judging them less valuable, or we're judging them as less spiritual. And yet he says, we're doing the same thing. <clears throat> and I thought about that, and I could just see a little kid saying, yeah, but I didn't murder anybody. He did. Johnny murdered somebody. I'm just a liar. I'm just a thief. But he murdered somebody. So can I judge you on that? It sounds fair, right? That's the problem, see. It, it doesn't matter. He's not saying, well, okay, you didn't sin and all those other things, but you have sin, and anything that you have that sin knocks you out of the ability to judge because you're just as bad. Why do you think that sin of, of lying is less than sin of murder, sin of cheating, sin of anger? And so... After pronouncing this great, horrible condition of mankind and then saying, but wait, it's easy for you to look at people who are practicing that and going, yeah, brother, I saw that downtown. Those, those people practicing all that debased sexuality. You know, I see those liars and those murderers down there. Yeah, that's right. And now he's kind of twisting it and saying, wait a minute. You who are looking at them from outside your congregation, are you not doing the same thing? So why are you any better? So you are actually, in doing so, condemning yourself, he says. You're doing the same things. Now, do we, we understand that when somebody has violated God's law, there's a consequence. That there's something that has happened. Somebody breaks the law in our country, we expect that. And that's what he's kind of showing now. You know, you're judging, but it's coming back on you. And we know that it rightly does. That's not a question. But the problem is, do you think that those who are practicing them honestly are going to get off and you're not, or you're not, and they are? I mean, what, where do you get this logic where somebody who is sinning and you're not sinning that type of sin, we're all in the same thing. Judgment of God will come on anybody that is sinning, period. There's no room to feel comfortable in this conversation that he's having. Or, or maybe this, maybe this, Paul says. Maybe, maybe you're assuming that because God is so kind and presumpt you're presuming that he's been forbearing it. He hasn't come and struck me down. I'm still getting a lot of wonderful things in my life. You think that's going to do it? And what Paul reminds us is that that long suffering and that forbearance is supposed to cause us to have time to look within our hearts and turn because God doesn't want anyone to be lost. But what is the condition? They've hardened their hearts in verse 5, he says. 
They have hardened it. They're storing up wrath. The longer you continue in that condition, the longer it's going to just build up. And you're the one that's not wanting to change. It's not that God. And so there's coming a day. There's coming a day that wrath will come upon you. So in verse 6 through 11, he says, he will render to each according to his works. Now, here we go with one of these words that I almost feel like I need to hand a card so we have them, so that when we talk about certain words, works is one of them. To the Jew, when, and when Paul's talking about the law, he's talking about mosaic works. But I think this is really a better one is your, your life, you know, what the results of what you're doing, your actions. You're going to be receive according to what your actions are, what the produce, the production of what you've accomplished. And he says, then those who practice patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He's going to give them eternal life. This passage here reminded me a lot of in the Mosaic law when it was received, him giving them the blessings and the curses in a very quick order because he's pretty much showing people that are going to follow, they'll get reward. Those who don't, the curses that they're going to receive. So, bottom line is, you're individuals. And what has occurred in your lives, what you have done, the resultant, is what you're going to be judged by. But there's two people. There's one through patience and yearning for righteousness. They are going to be rewarded. They're going to get eternal life. This is another one of these subtle passages where when people try to say that there's no punishment after death, that this judgment somehow, he very clearly in this passage shows that there's eternal life and there's an e a punishment that is going to be received. Those who are self-seeking, you know, self-seeking is all sin that is done. Any sin that you can think of is selfish. It's me not thinking about you. I'm the perpetrator. You're the victim. Whether it's I'm lying to you, stealing, murdering, whatever it is. I'm doing it because that's what I want. It's selfish. So it's interesting that you can see it right here. All those who are sinners, all those who are seeking themselves, they're not obeying the truth there's going to be a day of wrath and fury. Everyone who's doing evil, and this is where he starts to bring in the idea of the different cultures, to the Jew and to the Greek. Now, the Greek is in reference because he's talking to Romans. They're not Greeks. He's really kind of dealing with they are Roman, but they loved the wisdom of the Greeks. So there's a part of this inference or a compliment to the Romans, the Gentiles, because their wisdom came from there. The Jews came from Moses. The Gentiles, they believe wisdom came from the Greeks. So but it doesn't matter. Whatever your source is, it's still, there will be a day of reckoning. And the same thing, again, racially, it's equal peace and honor, punishment and turmoil, Greek, there's no partiality. That's what I think is powerful about this is he's leveling it to where no one can really feel comfortable with looking across the pew to another one in that congregation in Rome and feel comfortable judging that other person because somehow you're looking down on their sin or their behavior. So let's kind of wrap it up and look at this. The moralist, the one who thinks that he's good, he's guilty. The one who thinks that they're doing right regardless of what they're following, they're sinners. Everybody's a sinner. God's judgment is against all sin and it doesn't matter. And don't confuse God's long suffering, his patience, as somehow it's an endorsement just because he's waiting because that's a lot of times people think well 
I know as a kid, I used, when I'd get in trouble, I used to think about that. Well, Dad hadn't said anything yet. It's been two days now. It's three days. And then all of a sudden, guess what? Come Friday, we all got a whooping. We thought we got away with it because four days went by. And we thought, <laughs> he didn't say anything. We got away with it. Are we like that? Like little children that think that, well, because God's wrath didn't come down and strike me while I had my hand in the cookie jar while I was stealing or doing something? No, don't do that. I think that's one of the most the powerful messages of this is that just because, don't confuse his long suffering, that he's allowing it. What did he say? He uses that to give you and I an opportunity to reflect and give us a chance to repent and to turn around and, and do it. All unrighteousness is going to be condemned. There is a point in, his, in history, in the future, that is coming that we will all be punished if, according to our works, our relationship with him. And that he's not picking favorites. And why would that be interesting to the church there in Rome? Well, the Jews would say, but we're your favorites. No. So you see how morally he is really trying to equalize everybody and say, you have no right to judge anyone. No one. We are all sinners. And we also need to understand that there's wrath that will come upon that. And that if we reject his basic fundamental truths, there's consequences for that. And then he's going to continue this and look on. But I'm going to go ahead and stop there on my voice. And I'm, yeah, I'm going to stop there. So if you're here tonight and there's something we can do to help you in our, your relationship with him, if you're comfortable and you'd like to, we're going to be singing the invitation song. Um, let us know while we stand and sing.